Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to the Global Watch International Prayer Room Shabbat Call. This is July the 12th, 2024. It is 5 p.m. Jerusalem time, and we've gathered together on this Shabbat to enter into the unique rest of the Lord, that rest that he provides for each of us each week. We come together, we bless one another, we rejoice in the God of our salvation, and we thank you, Lord, that you have set aside a time for us to step out of the mundane and into the holy. And we thank you and praise you, Father, for this time. And I bless Michael Matt and his guest as he will be leading this watch. And we just thank you and praise you for Michael, for the calling that's on his life, for his family. We pray, Father, for a hedge of safety and protection round about him. We pray that everything that his hands touch for your kingdom would prosper. Thank you, Lord, that you've gifted him as a prolific writer, that you've gifted him as a speaker. And our hearts are open to hear what you would have to say through Michael and his guests today. And Father, I just pray that it would take us into that place of praying just a little bit deeper in areas, God, that are spoken of this day in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So I'd like to introduce the, the worship song. When I woke up this morning and came to my computer shortly afterwards, I was turning out just kind of praying, you know, Lord, what do you want me to study or look at this morning? So I opened YouTube and uh, YouTube will often provide some suggestions based on previous searches. So about a week ago, I put in a search uh, for the scripture from Joel about weeping between the porch and the altar. So this morning, I hadn't seen this before, up popped a suggestion by Leonard Ravenhill, weeping between the porch and the altar. Now that's one person I want to hear preaching on that subject. So I started it and I got eight seconds into it and I had to pause it because he opened up his message with a prayer, thanking God that we can be still and know that he is God. So then I knew this is the song, the worship song we need to open up the meeting with today. So let's, uh, let's go with the worship song by Karen Davis from uh, Psalm 46. Lord, I thank you that your presence is with us. As Moses said, I don't want to move one inch from here unless your presence goes with us. And we just thank you, Lord, for your provision of Sabbath, where we can reset with you, Lord. We can give this day to you and commune with you, Lord God. And thank you we can do that all the time. So, Lord, we just invite you uh, to lead us as we come into this time of sharing in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, Arnie Klein. Uh, Arnie is a New Yorker, as I am, and I met Arnie and his wife, Yonit, uh, in the mid-70s. And Arnie was also part of Times Square Church around the same time that David and Karen Davis uh, were sent out. Arnie was also encouraged by uh, Dave Wilkerson to uh, pursue his calling in Israel. So uh, Arnie and Yonit made Aliyah in 1992. Uh, they have a ministry which is more of a concept than an organization called Emmaus Way. Hmm. And some of the things that uh, Arnie shares on, on the website is worship is the response to the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> and the Lord directed them to prepare a place for his presence. So Arnie, we just welcome you in the name of the Lord and invite you to share what's on your heart this morning. Well, I, I, I love what you just said, that I haven't heard that before. I don't even think, maybe I almost thought of it, but brilliant. It's true. It's more of a concept. 
than than an organization or an actual ministry activity? Ah, well, I, I keep repeating this phrase. This is like a moment we've never had ever before. Where we're sitting right now is, I just, just wrote a letter and sending it out and said, how many times can we use the words like unbelievable, unimaginable, unprecedented, insane, absurd? It seems like they just keep getting used again and again. Um, I'll share a little bit, yes, of course, about what we're doing. But the moment here in Israel is there's continuing, deepening, expanding exposure of the events of October the 7th. It's very much on um, mainstream media. The country as a whole pretty much is losing all of its trust and confidence in military and political leadership. What continues to be uncovered is, I'd say we're too smart to be that incompetent or too professional to be that incompetent and too smart to be that stupid to for the things that happened on October the 7th to we years back <laughs> said that we wanted to be just like the other nations. Well, we've gone somewhat beyond that. And it started to show up in COVID, in the COVID season, that we're just not like the other ones. But we're about leading the pack. We're in the center, which, yeah, I mean, we know about that spiritually, that Israel's the center of the world, and it just seems like we're the center of the whole darkness exploding. You know, we're sitting and trying to balance God's love, God's anger with the nations, and his need to bring forth a bride. It's not so simple to understand what God is doing and where he is in the midst of everything right now. Our tendency is to look at the evil, the darkness, globalist powers, and now government leaders who were just what the, where they were on October the seventh. It's a friend of ours said there's a brother that lives down in the valley on a kibbutz right along the uh, Jordanian border. I mean, his house is like a thousand meters from the border. The, the kibbutz itself is less than a hundred meters from the border. And he's Sabra, native born, former IDF soldier. And he said, there's no doubt that the army and security establishment are working against the state. The magnitude of this makes me sick. That's what we're sitting with. Now, what do we look at? What do we think? Where is God? Sovereign Father, where is he? in the midst of all of this. 
uh, kind of says, be sitting in the midst of all of it. It's a very severe moment. And people look at the evil going on in the world. People point at the nation of Israel and all of its sins. But somehow, and we've traveled some, you know, been somewhat connected roundabout, have somewhat of a broad perspective from which we're speaking from, being believers for 50 years, living in Israel 32. Nobody talks about the body. And that nobody is qualified, of course. It's, it's not an absolute point. But it seems that when we talk about repentance, we're needing to repent for all of Israel's sins. But there's really not much of a consciousness of where we are as a body. I heard it said that the darkness in the world is a reflection of the absence of light in the church. Can you can you relate to that? The absence of light in the church. We've been speaking, carrying this thought for a bit. And waiting to see a commensurate number coming before the Lord, praying to see, longing to see, and saying, could you help us? Would you talk to us and explain to us? how you see this all, and what's going on. And it doesn't seem to happen. Brother, yesterday, pastor, very dear friend, wonderful fellow who's head of a lovely ministry in the land, really deep heart, said, the body's asleep. We're asleep. We've left our first love. But we don't know we're asleep. And I wondered, how did we leave our first love? How did, and what will it look like to return? to first love. We here, you know, in, in our lives and in our in our circle, settle at this point that this message to the church in Ephesus in Revelation, after the the list of <clears throat> wonderful things, I mean it might be the most commendable list of all of the churches that are listed. And then the Lord finishes by saying, but I have this one thing against you that negates everything else that he commended them for. Interestingly, that consider the thought <clears throat> the discourse of the seven churches starts off in Ephesus and it ends up in Laodicea. And I, I wonder that the, the result of leaving the first love 
ends up with the deception of Laodicea, where they have no idea where they are. And they think they're doing absolutely fine, but they couldn't be more wrong. <clears throat> so I guess the message, the thing that we have to talk about, which is our life, ministry, and concept that, that Michael mentions, has to do really with what this is, first love. What does it look like? We commonly relate to building the kingdom of God and working, working for God, spreading his message, his gospel, and, you know, all of that. But think for a minute of working in your father's business, but not really connecting personally with our father. This all started for me in 1986 when I had been asked to bring a message to a graduating class at an Assembly of God Bible School in, in the States. And I asked the Lord, what, what would you like me to, to tell them? You know, they're about to graduate, they're going to go off into ministry, mission field, you know, whatever. And he said, tell them about the most neglected mission field in the world. My heart. And went on to expound that with two basic pictures of scripture one was when mary miriam poured the oil on yeshua's feet that was you know worth a year's wages and every person in the room had the same comment now, the room was filled with Yeshua's followers, all of his central people. And every single person had the same comment. Can you imagine? What a waste. And they said, boy, what we could have done for people with all of that money. Shua made a, a comment that's really rather kind of interesting. When we look at it back from, from now, he said, you know, right, leave her alone. What she has done is anointing me for my burial. And wherever my gospel is preached, what she's done for me will be, what this woman has done will be spoken of. So you kind of wonder what, what, what he meant there, because it's, it's not like this woman pouring the oil on Yeshua's feet is the normal part of the gospel message. Except in the sense that it has to do with a, a complete pouring out of everything on him, which somehow is at the very heart of the message. Shall we say that Yeshua's burden was for his father first. Not people, but his father. His father's glory, his father's name. Not the people, but first the father. The other story that, that related was when Yeshua was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he had asked his Peter, James, and John to just be with him there for an hour. You think what what was he what was he asking them to do? Pray, intercede? No, it was just just to be there with him, like as if he would have said, I really don't want to be alone right now. Would would you just be with me? And it was very clear as I was 
receiving this from the Lord. This was almost 40 years ago. He, the impression, I can't remember the words exactly being spoken, but it wasn't any question that this isn't just something from back then. This is the state now. This is the state of the of the church now. This is the relationship, basically, that we have with God now. And the Lord communicated that he felt neglected. Can you imagine? Have you ever thought that? That he felt neglected? Feels neglected. Not really known, not really seen. Sought primarily for what he can do. What he can do for us, but just generally what he can do. You know, over the years, we've known some very wealthy people in Times Square Church. We're friends with a fellow who bought the Mark Hellinger Theater for David Wilkerson. He wrote a $20 million check. It was, it was nothing for him. You know, you, perhaps you've thought this, maybe, maybe not. People like that, with that kind of money, they don't have a lot of friends. Because how do they know, you know? People want to get close to them because of, of what they have. You know, it's, it's not so far-fetched to think that God actually deals with the same thing. He said, why do you want to be with me? You're coming to me. Why? Listen, of course, a father, a parent wants to bless his children. He wants to take care of what they need. But it doesn't take much to imagine what it would feel like. If your children only came to you when, you, when they needed something from you. So I stood there and shared this with 500 students in an auditorium, long pews. And in the end said, well, perhaps there's somebody here who has never come to God without asking him for something. And if so, perhaps you'd like to say you're sorry. It's the only altar call I've ever given in my life where the response was 100%. There was not a single person left in their seat. What does first love look like? Um, I guess the number one biblical character that comes to mind speaking of this subject is, is David. First one, right. Saying he was a man after God's heart. He cared how God felt. He related to God personally. Seems that it's not so common. We mostly didn't grow up in the church <laughs> thinking about our fulfilling God's needs. <laughs> Much to the contrary. Come to God, and he's going to bless you, and he's going to give to you. Well, this is all true. 
but look at the place that David ends up in. And, you know, David's, of course, you know, we all know his story. Pretty sordid life King David had. You know, this was not a, a, a pristine character whose, you know, life was an example of really, you know, <laughs> cleanliness and holiness. But everything in David's life of the sordid from the sordid side was outweighed by this one thing. He cared about God personally. Such that in Revelation, when she was introducing himself, he says, he who holds the key of David. Isn't that strange? That the one, the creator, David's maker, is identifying himself as holding the he identified with someone he created. It's, it's like, it's, it's sort of backwards, right? You would think it's like, so Yeshua, David holds the key of Yeshua. So what is Yeshua telling us with this identification about David? And what's this a key? You know, we, I'm sure you, you, you've all been exposed to or stepped into it sometime or other, you know, somebody taking hold of the key of David and doing this with it and turning it and locking it and tearing it down and, you know, all that stuff that we do in the charismatic church. I'd suggest that key of David is the key to God's heart. It's simple. He just cared. That's all. How does God feel? What does God think? What does this look like to him? What does it mean? What is he doing? Our normal pattern, okay, normal, normal, you know, normal is, is never absolute. Um, what is our normal pattern when we, when we come to a situation that is problematic, like what we're in right now <laughs> across the world, but especially in Israel? And we're asking God to do what? To save, to heal, deliver, to forgive, to... But did we ask? Do we ask? What are you doing? Where are you right now? Habakkuk chapter 1. There's a statement. The Lord says, I'm about to do something. I think it's verse 4. He says, I'm about to do something. If it were told to you, you wouldn't believe it. He is declaring that he's raising up the Chaldeans, Babylonians, who were going to destroy the temple and Jerusalem about 100 years from now. He said, I'm doing this. So in Jeremiah's time, when it happened, You don't imagine that most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem said, this is the hand of the Lord, God is doing it. But he made it clear to them. He said, okay, you receive this and you let them take you into captivity, you'll be okay. But if you fight with them, you will die. Because I'm doing this. I am doing this. And we're in a situation right now here in Israel that I think is, I hope you all out there 
understand that Israel is a prophetic sign that everything that God does actually comes forth out of Israel. It's birthed here. It's first to the Jew. Everything, everything is first here. And that the, the dynamics of what's happening here, because of the intensity, the nature of the land, and the size, and the body, and all kinds of things, it's so visible. It's a microcosm. That is a, a, a physical manifestation, physical Israel. Consider this. I mean, I, I, I live with this thought as, as truth. Uh, you have to sit with it for yourselves, because if it is true, it's quite something. That what's happening in physical Israel, in the nation of Israel, natural Israel, is a physical manifestation of the spiritual reality of the church. Israel of God. The people of God, Jew and Gentile, one new man, the Israel of God. That the actual spiritual reality of the Israel of God is pictured in the manifestation of natural Israel. So, so what if we, we agreed and we said, um, okay, all right, I I get it, I that um Israel, we in the church. Question, have we left our first love? Hmm. Is, is God manifest in our meetings? When we come to meet with him, do we come with a program? Do we come with a plan? Do we know what songs are going to be sung, like from the day before? And do we know who's giving a message? And is that pretty much the way it happens every week? Do we imagine coming actually to the God the real God, the manifest present by the Holy Spirit God, have, having everything planned? People talk about, we say, being led of the Spirit. And I guess that, that might mean different things to different people. Spirit. In Hebrew, the, the name is the Ruach. The word is the Ruach. It means the wind. And what does it say? What does the scripture tell us about the nature of the spirit like the wind? We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going. Is that what we experience when we come together? Because that's his nature. So if this is not our experience, that we come out of a meeting and go, oh my gosh, what was that? Where did that come from? How did that happen? Whoa, I could never explain this to anybody. That's what it's like. It's got to be like coming out of meeting with God. So if it's not, if we step into this thing and it's all planned out, is he there? Well, if he's not, then are we sitting in first love? So like, yeah, first I left, yeah, first love, we gotta, it can sound like this romantic thing, you know, that's just, wow, I gotta get a hold of this. <laughs> but when we read it in scripture, he says, I'm taking your lampstand away. That means abject darkness. 
That means the loss of everything. First love is not a nice idea. It's not a special concept. It's everything. That's the way I understand it. Again, read what he said to the church in Ephesus. It was everything. And David had this, and it was everything. So this is where we got awakened to this. 38 years ago, 1986. And then 11 years later, another message came about, it had to do in particular with, with the the inheritance of the tribe of Dan, who, if you'll notice, is not listed with the other tribes in Revelation. I was reading this. It caught my attention, which I have to say is I don't get normally grabbed by stuff like that, but it popped off the page. I mean... With difficulty, I would name all of the 12 tribes, right? So, like, just for me to notice that one of them is missing is like, this is unusual. <laughs> I'm looking for, you know, important life stuff, not for this kind of thing. So, I, I saw it, and I went digging around. I said, well, why is this? And it turns out that Dan's the only tribe that never lived in their inheritance. Not only did they, you know, the others didn't cast out all the inhabitants, but Dan, Dan never lived in it at all. A lot to say about the nature of Dan and the prophecy from his father Jacob and his name means judgment and what does it mean and what did it cost us that Dan never lived in inheritance and you 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 can go to a Arnie Klein YouTube and there's a list of 52 messages there and Dan's inheritance is one of them you can see the details of all of this and a lesson from the land I think maybe it's called but the thing I want to share was that the Lord communicated at that point that because Dan never lived in their inheritance, that there is the gift that Dan had, which is righteous judgment, was never released into the council of Israel. And that the people, the, the, the Canaanite group that, that kept him out, the Amorite, they're still influential. And this is in the area of Tel Aviv. And we heard this. The Lord said, Dan's inheritance needs to be released. The, the Amorite needs to be bound. And you can't do it. This is the point of this moment's message. You can't do it. You do not have the commensurate unity in the body to stand in the face of these ancient regional spirits. The only thing you can do is make a place for me that when I come, that spirit will back off. Now, this is 27 years ago. Now, when we look at what's happened, going from um, 9-11, Jumping to the presidential election in 2016, to COVID, to October 7th. In particular with COVID, that was the, that was the, the quantum shift in, in, in my thinking. I said, ah, now the battle is global. Now it's global. The spiritual powers that are influencing us, influencing people day to day, are of global magnitude. All the news people had the same talking points. We saw it. It was across the globe. 
So the point is, in 97, he talked about a regional spirit. Now we're talking about a global principality. So if we couldn't stand against the regional spirit in 97, what are we going to do against the global principality? Right. So we track through the years. And we see the level of spiritual power of darkness released increasing and increasing which means they have more authority. They're able to go deeper into our lives. They're able to affect more stuff. So the warfare, you know, you go from, you're dealing with, you know, privates to generals. You're going from bows and arrows to bombs. Okay. So here's what picture I see. Yeah, more or less, you'll get the message. So here we are, we've got a shield that we're holding up. We've got a shield. And it stops bullets. It's really good stopping bullets. The enemy starts sending RPGs, anti-tank missiles, and we're still holding the same shield. Is that true? Is that a true picture? Is that, is, is that where we are? Okay. So I answer this question. It, 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 it's sort of a, a no-brainer that the spiritual battle has increased, that the level of the battle has increased, that the nature of the principalities has increased. Can you point to something, either in your local assembly or in the church as a whole, that has changed in the last... 20 years, what we're doing differently to keep pace with the increase of the battle. Is there anything, has there been any significant, measurable, recognizable shift? So we ask for awakening revival, outpouring, the rain. A lot of words, different words that basically are, you know, different images for the same thing. And one of the images is new wine. Okay, looking for new wine. What's it going to take? So now we're going to equate Revival, awakening, all of that. We're calling it new wine. Okay, that's everything. New wine. It's the presence of the Lord. The wine is the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the presence of the Lord. So we're looking for a new manifestation of the presence of the Lord. What's it going to take? A new wine skin. Duh. It's pretty straight up, right? You can't fix the old wineskin. Oh, gosh. Oh, we've been trying to patch it. We're going here and there and trying to get them to this and get them to that and see whatever. And the Spirit says, you can't do that. It won't work. You can't take a building that has no foundation and renovate it and fix it. You have to tear it down and put the foundation in from the start. We actually had a building that we renovated in, in Tel Aviv that had no foundation. And we basically, it was, it was a ridiculous situation, but the building should have been torn down. But instead, they found some other extremely expensive way to put a foundation under an existing building. New wineskin. In the few minutes we have left. The... You check you go to some court and you check this for yourself. There's new wine skin and new wine, and the, and the Greek there is two different words for new. The word that's used for new wine is only relative to the age of production, so it's the same stuff, 
Same formula, exactly the same, but it's been produced yesterday instead of last year. But the word for new wineskin, that's the word, the same word for new that's used when it says we are new creations. It's a completely different form, a completely different structure. And the Lord is waiting, needing a new wineskin. And it's for us to go before him and say, could you explain this to me? Could you tell me what this looks like? So if it's a new wineskin, that means it's different than the old one. And that means it's either going to be there's something like that we did that we won't do anymore. Or there's something that we didn't do that we're going to do. Okay, it's got to be one of those things or it's still the old thing. Okay, so, Lord, we need to come and sit down and say, here I am. Talk to me. Tell me what you need. Now, the wrap-up is this. There's two sides to the coin. But let's keep the first in the first place. The first side, the first dynamic, is ministering to God's heart, giving him a dwelling place, satisfying father's longing for his children to come to be with him. This is what he created us for. That's the primary motivation, not to get him to do something. The flip side of the coin is that we cannot deal with what's going on in the world that only he can do it. And when we come to him and make a place for him just to be with him and his presence comes, he deals with what we can't deal with. But we're not coming to ask him to do it. We're coming just to be with him. If you go to our website, Michael put up the, the link on the homepage. There are four messages that we delivered in the UK. And it's about creating outposts of heaven to make on earth like it is in heaven the point and purpose is for god to feel at home everything will flow from this everything will flow out of this this is the point this is the hinge this is the quantum shift this is the foundational dynamic, my opinion, of course, that's missing, and it boils down to God is not the center of the church. The church is the center of the church, not God. We're functional in the way we think, not relational. It doesn't work. Function flows out of relationship. And relationship looks like first love. And first love is, so, you know, and I, we're, we're, we're 55 years married. And we don't have to do anything. We don't have to go anywhere. Let's go on a car wash date, you know. <laughs> it's just, let's just sit here and, and look at each other. We don't have to say anything. You know, it's just to be together. I mean, I said to her today, we were in a conversation about some deep stuff and said, your fellowship and relationship to me is just, it's just so critical to my life. It's so central. Just her being there and letting me talk. It's just, oh, beloved God feels this way. I, I encourage you, you know, there's, there's, there's four messages. The first one is about God's heart. If that's the only one that you can get to, it expounds this. It's something we need to sit with. You know, I mean, this this is this didn't grab my heart fully as it has it now when I first heard it. But it's been a development of sitting with it and considering it and, and meditating on it. More to say, but you can get it all from, <laughs> from those four messages. And then there's one other thing. We didn't talk about Israel at all. A little bit we did. But on that homepage, there's also a link to a course. It's called Israel Revealed. It's a 10-session discussion course, not a teaching. And it was designed 
for people who, who already know that Israel is important, it's not a counter to replacement theology. But it starts down the line with people who know Israel is important, but like you go, so why do you pray for Israel? He said, well, because God loves Israel. Why do you love Israel? God loves Israel. Well, why does God love Israel? Why? Because God chose Israel. Well, why did God choose Israel? Uh, I don't know. Okay. It's written for them guys. <laughs> Maybe you guys. <laughs> um, the two things. This is all that I've got to give. One is God's heart needs to be in the front of us, and we need to understand Israel from his perspective so we know what to do in the midst of all that's going on. So Thank you, Arnie. This has been rich. You're welcome. I think the proper I, I way to conclude our time is to have communion together. Yeah. So I'll, I'll lead us in communion, and then I'll turn it over to... Uh, Bill to do the ironic be uh, benediction and Shirley to close. So uh, there's short notice, but uh, please uh, get your communion elements. Wow. And I'd like to use this time just a fresh uh, dedication to the Lord, to mm. uh, love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, Amen. and to love our neighbors ourself. It's Jesus said that's like unto it. Mm. So Lord, uh, we just want to respond to this message and uh, particularly the word you shared with the Ephesian church. Uh, mm. God, uh, and if there are any ways, God, you search the heart, any ways we've departed from our first love, thank you that you're faithful and just to show it to us. And as we confess it to you, you forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, that's our heart's desire uh, to be in the place uh, that Mary of Bethany was in. So Lord, we just thank you for your body, for coming to the earth to live a sinless life and to offer yourself a sacrifice unto your Father and on our behalf. So we just partake of this element, this uh, bread, in remembrance of your body that was broken for us. Mm -hmm. Please take it in Yeshua's name. Thank you. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we thank you for the blood of Yeshua, the sinless blood of Yeshua that was applied to the very throne room of God for the redemption of all mm. that would believe in you, Lord God. So, mm. Lord, we just thank you that that full price has been paid. Mm. And, Lord, may, us, may we understand this in a greater measure that we may truly give ourselves fully to you. So, Lord, we just partake of this element in remembrance of you. So I'll turn it over to Bill and Shirley to close us out. Thanks again, Arnie. This has been a blessing and a lot to chew on. Blessings to you all. It's a critical moment, and you all have such parts to play with us. Iberachaka Adonai Beish Maracha, Ya Er Adonai Penavalacha, Vichaneka, Isa Adonai Penavalacha, Via Simlacha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with peace. Shalom. Beshem Yeshua Hamashiach. Amen. Wow. Amen and thank you. Thank you, Arnie. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you, Lord, for spotlighting first love, what it is and what it isn't. We thank you, Lord, for a deeper call. And Lord, may every heart respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, Arnie, for coming and sharing your heart with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. And mm -hmm. thank you, everyone who's been on the call. 
And if you would unmute, bless Michael and Arnie, and we say Shabbat Shalom to each and every one of you. May the Lord keep you and watch over you until we meet again. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Arnie. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. May God bless you. Thank you, 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 Thank you,